Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 106th episode of the Timing Research Show for October 3rd, 2016. My name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of timingresearch.com. And today we will be discussing the 158th weekly report. Uh, so if you, have, if you have not had a chance to take a look at this yet, just go to timingresearch.com slash reports, and you can download this or any past report there. I have Rob Hanna back to host today, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Thanks, David. Thanks for, thanks for having me again. It's, uh, it's always enjoyable getting to do these shows, and I think the more I've done them, the more people I've gotten to know. Um, and I think today I've talked to all of these guys before at one point or another, so this should be fun. Uh, I get to catch up with so, some old names. Um, we're we're going to have Lance Ippolito from Alpha Shark on, I believe, but he's not quite checked in yet. Um, we also have Jason Jankowski from The Lion Online, John Thomas from Mad Hedge Fund Trader, and Jim Kenny from The Option Professor. Uh, so why don't I go down, I guess, in that order, and I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what it is you do, and uh, after that we'll get into it with some questions. So uh, Jason, can we, can we start with you maybe? Absolutely. So... Um, you want to uh, you want me just to mention something to the listeners about what I do and and my trading background? I'm assur I'm assuming, right? Yeah, just trading background and and, and uh, you uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, the line online also. Sure. Okay. Well, um, the uh, my trading background. I've been trading a little more than thirty years now. I started in 1986 as a customer, and uh, loved the business so much that I wanted to get into it full time and uh, became a registered Series 3 commodities broker in the uh, 80s. And uh, currently what I do now is mostly education and training from a psychological perspective, more so than anything else. I firmly, firmly believe that the psychology behind trading is more significant than your personal uh, trading method or approach, your technical or fundamental analysis, anything that you put together to help build your market presence will have a probability of that edge working and, and maximizing that probability is really more to do with how you think and how you perform and how you behave and the controls on your behavior and the choices that you make. And uh, I spent a lot of time uh, educating and training people on mastering their own personal psychology. Uh, right now, the line online, I'm taking a break from actually teaching and training and I'm focusing on my own personal trading. Uh, okay. So, Currently, right now, I just do my own trading on my own accounts. I focus on foreign exchange more than anything else. But uh, people are always welcome to contact me, and, and I start conversation and dialogue with anyone anytime. So if they want to, all they have to do is go to the website and say hi. Just want to say hi, put me on your mailing list, and we'll be good to go. All right, great. Well, I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, and Lance, nice of you to finally make it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you tried to sneak in, but I didn't let it, that slip by, so... Um, uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little about yourself. Uh, I mean, we've talked before, but um, uh, tell the people here about Alpha Shark and, uh, and, and about what you do. Uh, so, uh, kind of similar, I uh, was a CTA uh, managing a commodities fund, um, and really about a year and a half ago, broke out of the whole money management field and started trading my own capital. You know, I didn't have to wear a a suit and tie and get dressed up every day and meet people and entertain clients. Now I work out of my house and uh, make my own schedule basically. So you know, I, I love the transition. Um, and at Alpha Shark, uh, I'm a moderator and we call ourselves trading educators during the day. We trade our own uh, live accounts, our own capital, and people can hop into the live trading room. And see our screens. So see our screens during the day, participate in the live chat room, ask us questions. Uh, we have educational webinars as well. And our big focus on AlphaShark is unusual option activity. You know, we have an option scanner for all institutional order flow going throughout the day. Um, and really kind of see, you know, what, what's the large institutions, the large traders, where are they putting their money? Is it a stock about to get bought out? Is it a certain sector where uh, we see a lot of uh, option activity flowing. So our kind of bread and butter, I would say, is unusual option activity. And then we have myself, 
uh, and another moderator trading futures um, for Alpha Shark as well, focusing on that. And uh, going back to the previous guest, you know, I'm a big believer on the emotional aspect of trading. I really find that entertaining uh, and really, you know, Hurting traders, I feel like emotions more than anything else. It's not lack of information. It's more you know, dealing with being in a position or entering or exiting a position. Yes, people uh, holding on too long to the losers and not uh, and, and getting out of the winners too early, uh, not letting them run, things like that can uh, uh, can destroy an account. I, yeah. I think exactly. we've all seen that. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Lance. We'll come back to you in a bit. Um, uh, Lance knows what he's talking about, and and so uh, uh, look forward to hearing uh, your comments on the market uh, a little later on. Let's go to uh, let's go to John Thomas, Mad Hedge Fund Trader. Morning, guys. Um, I I'm only uh, been trading for 50 years, so I'm just starting to get the hang of it. Uh, I'm a slow learner. You can go to our website at madhedgefundtrader.com. Uh, we offer the full range of trading services, trade mentoring, trade alert services, live chat rooms, daily research newsletters, uh, options trading. Uh, we basically cover it all. We cover all asset classes, stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, precious metals, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, we have, the newsletter has been around for 10 years. I started the International Equity Division at Morgan Stanley about 35 years ago, and uh, this is my retirement. Trading's in my blood. I love doing it. <laughs> I'm going to have to cold, pry my cold, dead fingers away from my keyboard uh, when I die, because I'll, I'll have just done the perfect trade <laughs> right when I die. So um, uh, you're welcome to visit our site anytime. We I have about 10,000 pages up there, and uh, uh, we our goal is to help people make money. All right. Well, uh, 50 years is a long time in the market. I'm not sure I believe you there since you look about 35. Uh, well, I, I'm sure <laughs> my girlfriend would say that. But, uh, yeah, it's actually, I actually did my first trade 55 years ago. Wow. And... Uh, my my cost basis on Apple is twenty five cents. <laughs> we did the IPO for Apple. And I still have some stock left over from that original buy. So you got a, you got a little bit of unrealized gains in that one, I guess. I, I don't dare sell it. I, I'm waiting to die. <laughs> my heirs, because then you get to step up with the cost basis. If I sell it now, it all goes to capital gains taxes. Yeah, well, you know the <laughs> banks are. Day. Banks are too big to fail, and your apple's too big to sell right now, right? Yeah, and my Tesla cost is sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, all right, well, let's. Uh, thanks, John. Um, let's go to Jim Kenny. Jim, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I provide the content over there at OptionProfessor.com, and what we've got over there is basically an educational DVD set going over all the different uses and risks of the options. I guess we all know there's a lot of moving parts and options and there's a whole lot of different strategies. And after you get into a strategy, uh, rolling them up or down or doing uh, different types of maneuvers uh, after you're in there is uh, kind of important to know a little bit about. So uh, we try to give a, uh, a comprehensive overview on everything from covered call writing, spread, strangles, uh, put writing, and all the different tactics. And then after you're in the tactic, you know, what other alternative you have if the market moves up or down against you. So there's a lot there, obviously, and the seven DVDs uh, are very, very helpful for people to put into their education uh, arsenal and then basically uh, get our viewpoint on how uh, how they go. All right, great. Well, it looks like uh, I'm one of the few. I think me and Jason, uh, I don't know, Jason might get into a, uh, to options, some he didn't mention options, but everybody else is uh, is into options. options I, I, I have a, a great point of view on options. If you want, when when it comes my time to speak, I'll be happy to enlighten you on them if you like. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I'll, I'll wait my turn. Okay. Um, I don't do a whole lot with options. I have I've uh, I've been trading since the mid '90s. Uh, kind of went full time at it 
and uh, started a, a partnership or hedge fund, for lack of a better word. It's a small uh, family partnership for the most part. Uh, in 2001, uh, I wrote for trading markets for several years. I, I ran, uh, I started Quantifiable Edges in 2008. I've been running that ever since. Um, in 2012, I began a site called Overnight Edges that looked at um, uh, trading the overnight market, and that that was uh, merged with uh, Master the Gap, which is a Scott done by Scott Andrews, and we became Investaquant. Uh, and at Investaquant, we do a lot of uh, quant trading type systems and and, and edges based on. Uh, Anything from a swing time frame, so up to maybe five days, uh, down to uh, uh, intraday trading, so uh, gap trades and range breakouts and things like that. Um, so my trading really is focused anywhere on the the, the five days to um, now a little bit more in the, the intraday trading, although uh, uh, my expertise remains uh, more swing, uh, and then we do that at uh, at Investquant and Quantifiable Edges. Um, so let's, uh, let's go through and I want to ask each of you, uh, I guess the first couple questions here we'll, we'll tackle, which is, um, uh, what are the odds you are placing on, uh, the market closing up or down, I guess odds that close up, um, from today's open to Friday's close. And then what's your confidence level on them? And we'll get into, um, the, the whys and what you're looking for this week a little after, but let's just try and run through kind of quickly on this and, and uh, identify whether each of us is a, is a bull or a bear for the week. Um, and I'm going to mix it up here. I'm going first. So. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll say that I'm uh, a slight bull for the week. Um, there's really, I'm not seeing a whole lot, uh, either way. Uh, so I'm going to look at the, uh, invest quant five day swing odds. And they say there's a 55% chance we're higher at the end of the week. And I'm going with that. Uh, so I don't have a huge confidence level, but I'd say I'm bullish and on a scale of one to 10, about five and a half basically. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to Jim Kenny, we'll go in reverse order. Jim, where where are you at? Well, where I'm at is is uh, 21.32 last week's low. Uh, if it can hang in there, then I think the odds are probably going to be that we drift back up because from what I'm hearing, these employment reports as we get closer to the end of the week are supposed to be either pretty good and then, of course, revisions can happen for the month of August, which could be pretty good. And I'm looking at the VIX, you know, being in, interested in options, the VIX uh, had a spike up towards 16, went back down to 1250, uh, came back up here to 1450, and now it's fading a bit at 1398. So if we can keep the, the VIX under 16, uh, the market could drift higher a little bit as we go into the end of the week. And I'd, okay. be, about, I'd, I'd be about where you are because obviously any news event is going to throw these ideas out the window. So let's just call it 55. Yeah, and we may be susceptible to news for the next month or so, it appears. Uh, so uh, thank you, Jim. So we got two kind of slightly bullish guys. Uh, let's, go to, uh, let's go to John, see where you're at. Well, I'm just going to look at the Nevada poll results, which so 51-49 in favor of Hillary. So I'm 51-49 in favor of the market this week. <laughs> Okay. You know, uh, with not with fifty one percent conviction, uh, you know the uh, uh, the next for the next month the all the big moves in the market are going to be election driven. If uh, Trump can deliver a half decent performance next week, uh, there will be a big sell off. And if he does a repeat of the last debate, then uh, we'll get another spike up, a Hillary spike up. Uh, Deutsche Bank is, was a one-day wonder. There's no way they're going under. There's no way that Germany sacrifices Deutsche Bank but rescues Greece. Uh, and I think we're basically looking at a sideways move going into the election. You know, we could be stuck in this 4% range going all the way into the election. 
Uh, after that, you may get a you know a either pre or post election breakout to the upside at a new high. So, you know, this week flat, this month flat. Uh, the fireworks really get going in November. And your uh, November prediction assumes that Florida is able to count all their votes within a few months. You know, Hillary can lose <laughs> Florida. We can just write Florida <laughs> off. You know, just give it to ISIS. They <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, she, Hillary Clinton has such an overwhelming lead in the Electoral College, which is the only thing that counts, that it's a mathematical impossibility for her to lose at this point. Of course, Trump keeps digging, uh, you know, uh, a, di a deeper hole for himself every week. Yep. All right. Um, Jason. Where are you at with us? We got so far, it's pretty boring. We got three guys that are just a little bit bullish for the week. Tell me, yeah, so bad. I, I would, I would say that uh, I would have to agree with um, uh, the rest of the panel so far. I, I think that we're slightly bullish. I, I think I'd be a little bit more than fifty-one to fifty-five percent uh, committed to the bull side. I'd be closer to eighty percent. Um. I give you a lot of reasons for that, but uh, I think the bottom line is is that the uh, the market itself is is caught in a range, and the the stops I've noticed from my personal experience with understanding how stops are placed and where they probably are, they keep getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and and one side or the other is going to get hit on those stops in a big way, and that can happen at any minute. I think that we're we're the range trade is is I think poised for an upside break. I don't think the bears are in control of the market. I think the bulls are in control of the market. I think the bulls are still very, very committed to one side. I think they really believe that the election outcome is going to be bullish for the stock market. And I think they're, they're really committed to it. They're not taking those trades off. So their stops, that's professional money, of course. Their stops are too far out of range to drive the market appreciably lower, in my opinion. I think that what will happen is uh, non-farm will will probably surprise to the downside, and that'll be immediately interpreted as the Fed's got no firepower to move anytime soon to raise rates, and so stocks will rally. I think that's really where uh, the psychology is at behind the S and P's right now. Is I think people are just they buy dips. Smart money's got their stops way out of range because they've made a boatload of bank. And I think the people that are looking for tops are uninformed traders for the most part. And they sell rallies, and those guys just don't have the firepower to keep the market pushed lower. And their stops keep getting tighter and tighter. I mean, we're ready for a really big upside move, and that could be any time now. And that this week could be the catalyst. So I'd say, you know, assuming that all things being equal, we get a, a poor number to end the week, stocks will be to the upside by the close on Friday, you'd have a nice opportunity to liquidate any longs that you purchase here, maybe slightly lower, I think. Yeah, and let me jump in here and point out, it's not just stocks that are moving in narrow sideways ranges, it's everything. If you look at yeah. bonds, oil, yeah. commodities, precious metals, everything is showing the identical chart. Everything's waiting for the election to happen. The yeah. big news are all gonna happen either just before or just after. So yeah, I think um, you're right. Yeah. Big part of my sideways boring thesis uh, until the, the end of the year. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on all that, John. I think that the uh, the real issue is the market is, is waiting to find out because this is a really big, unusual, fundamental event. We never had an election that was quite this odd, I think, in recent memory. And um, regardless of the candidate you're picking or how you view the election, the bottom line is, from a standpoint of net net, people are worried across the board. They don't know. They you know they they don't know what it's going to mean until it settles out. And you know, scared money doesn't usually buy. Uh, so once they've got an idea about what it is that they really feel is going to be the solution, and they got a higher degree of certainty, that that probably can't happen until actually after the election. But once there's a higher degree of certainty, that's when you're going to see the bigger moves. I think right now the market is still net net looking for higher prices because I think they really believe that it's going to be a Clinton win. And if it's a Clinton win, it's more of the same. Uh, and it becomes more, I think, concise. People know what will expect to be happening. And if that's the case, uh, you still have a little bit of upward bias. I think a Trump would just, a Trump win would scare everybody so much. I don't know 
how that would how that would really it, it might be the perfect thing for the country in the long run you know but in the short run i think it would scare a lot of people and people wouldn't know what to do or what to expect i think a trump one would get you a pretty quick 25 percent drop in the stock market possibly before it even he, he would be inaugurated that would well, be that, yeah i'd be a big buyer on that dip you know well then i'd be a buyer yeah down yeah. 25. but you know absolutely it would be more of the same you're absolutely right and more of the same means 300 percent rise off the bottom of the s p 500 for eight years that works for most people especially people <laughs> in the industry. It works for most people. Yeah, it worked for me. <laughs> you want your net worth to triple or not over the next eight years? I actually think the trip will be a low number for the next day because we have the big we have a golden age setting up for the twenty twenties. There's a. There's well, um, I was going to say I'm not sure that if Trump wins, it won't be more of the same anyway because it seems to me that. Many Democrats, and he doesn't have a whole lot of support from his own party either. So him getting anything done is seems to be unlikely. So we'll probably still have more of whatever was going on. Executive order, executive order. That seems yeah. to work. Executive order. Yeah, that seems that's to work. To be. Yeah. Um, all right, Lance. We've ignored you for a long time. Why don't I? Uh, why don't I go to you? So far, we got four bulls. At least Jason's going out on a limb a little bit more than the rest of us. Um, but I'm glad to hear that you are guaranteeing the market's going to go way down this week, Lance. Well, you know, every time I come <laughs> on the show, I am, I'm, a, I'm not only a bull, I'm a giddy bull because I can't even believe my own words. You know, I say the market's going up. Why? Well, simply just because, uh, but, <laughs> but I, I can't say that this week and, um, for the first time in actually a while, and I always say, you know, I would never step in front of this this train, you know, I think it's going to stop and reverse. Uh, but for this week, and since we're going for this week higher or lower, I actually think in about a 70% chance that the market will go lower this week. Now, I'm not talking about 100 S&P points lower. I'm talking maybe 30 to 40 points in the S&P is lower. You know, kind of like a day like today, where we're down about 10 handles. There's not really aggressive selling. We're just kind of trickling lower. Same thing in the NASDAQ, just, you know, not seeing aggressive uh, ticks or anything in the Eternals that are saying, hey, this is aggressive selling. Uh, but I'm just looking for a week of kind of, you know, we pull back, kind of take a deep breath, um, and then wait for mid to late October to see if we're going to have that another swoosh up, we'll have some of these momentum names reporting uh, earnings. You know, I think that, depending on how these momentum names report earnings, that can drive the market up or down. But for this week, after the run in Amazon, uh, Google had a nice run, you know, Facebook's kind of pulled back a little bit. You know, even Apple's just kind of settling uh, below this 115. I, I just think the market kind of quietly heads lower this week. Um, and look for later in the month uh, for some a more confidence in a direction. Uh, I think only a couple of semiconductors report this week. I mean, semis had an incredible run last week. You know, moving that Nasdaq up, just a little, you know, deep breath, a little pullback this week. Uh, you know, I think it will be. I don't want to say normal, but just I'm leaning about seventy percent towards that. The market kind of just drifts slower. You know, not. Not that we're going to you know, crash or head lower. We kind of just move a little slower uh, and move to the downside a little bit. Okay. All right, good. Uh, you're my new favorite guest this week because you disagreed with the rest of us. Thank so you. It's so <laughs> on the other side of the aisle. <laughs> it's usually the quiet guy who's right. <laughs> usually I am the biggest fool. I fully admit it. But this week, you know, I was thinking about it last night, and I was actually – trading the NASDAQ futures this morning, I was like, so we incredible run. I mean, how much more Amazon 1000 price targets can there get? You know, I just think people are getting a little too giddy just buying these new all time highs. You know, if Amazon falls 10 to 20 points, it's not the end of the world, but you know, some of these Momo names just calm down a little bit. They're just, you know, every firm's upgrading them. Um, you know, I kind of just want to take a different approach, kind of, you know, look on the opposite side of the trade, 
um, from what the firms and the analysts think. Right. Um, all right. Well, I, I appreciate your, your perspective. Um, I'm going to go back now and, and kind of see if people have anything to add to their um, uh, to their predictions. So, Lance, uh, I'll let you keep going if uh, if you want, or if there are certain things. So, either add your predictions, or if there's things that you're looking at this week that could could move the market. You know, uh, like the uh, vice presidential debate or um, uh, any other news events. Um, such as an employment report or, or, or whatever it is, are, are, there, are, there, are there things you're looking at this week? Could be technical factors too that um, uh, you think will have a big impact on the market. I think there's a few Fed speakers this week, and I'm just not a fan of having Fed speakers chat when the market's going on because you know I don't have a live stream what they're saying. Even if I did know, I wouldn't know how to trade it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of their chatter. You know, I think it could spook the markets, good or bad, um, on that aspect. And I do feel like this Deutsche Bank news, you know, was it a one and done? Possibly. But still, European financials, that dark cloud, uh, really over the past year, has been lingering. You know, had a couple of lightning bolts uh, last week. I, I just don't think banks are going to just jump up like they did Friday. I think they're going to pull back a little bit, and that can drag the market down too. Uh, I just think too much fear, you know, for this week could cause the market to sell off slightly. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lance. Uh, John, how about you? Uh, what, what are you looking at this week? You know, it's back to nothing again. <laughs> you know, the uh, the only way the vice presidential debates are going to have an impact if it is if one of the candidates says he has a sex tape on the internet on the other one. So, uh, you know, barring that, uh, you're not going to get the same fireworks that you did in a in a Trump Hillary. Uh, 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 yeah. Debate. So we're all basically waiting for October 9th, 9th to see if Hillary can do a repeat, and and Trump does a repeat also. Uh, you know, my my Republican friends tell me, oh, he knows what the questions are now. Uh, he now has two weeks to prepare. But you know, the questions weren't exactly a surprise last time, and this amount of preparation requires a lifetime, not a two-week cramp course from Rudy Giuliani and uh, Chris Christie. So uh, I, I just see more churn, um, but you know, when we break out, it's going to be technology, 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 because technology is virtually the only industry where the long-term fundamentals justify buying it at an all-time high now. You know, and if you're a financial advisor and you want to make a mistake on your timing, make it with technology stocks. Because you can at least say, oh, well, they're going to double in three years, so just turn the TV off and ignore the volatility. You can't necessarily say that about banks or healthcare or okay. any of the other big sectors in the market. It's, it's become the safe place to go. And let's face it, global negative interest rates are driving money into the U.S. stock market in a major way. I mean, we even have the Japanese government buying our tech stocks now. So... Um, I think that's where you have to go, and that's why these things are all making straight line moves upward with no breaks. You really have to just close your eyes and buy if you want to get into an Amazon or something like that, uh, or a Facebook, or a Microsoft, uh, or any of the, the big leading names. Okay, interesting. Thank, yeah, I, uh, I hear what you're saying. Um, Jim Kenny. Well, a couple of things that I'm looking at for this week um, coming up. Obviously, those unemployment reports at the end of the week. Uh, tomorrow, you got PMI. It was under 49. They're looking for it to be above 50. Maybe people could get excited on that. And then um, you've got um, um, ADP, I think, coming out uh, with their guess on unemployment, too. So these, there could be some stuff going on there. But, you know, the bigger picture, I would think, would be these uh, European banks, because uh, not since uh, the oil stocks getting whacked and bringing uh, companies uh, such as uh, Royal Dutch down to 35 and 
British Petroleum all the way down to 27, Chevron to 75, Suncor down to 18. Have we seen an industry with big names, you know, getting so discounted? And so, um, you know, people do a lot of different investing. Uh, some of the preferreds on these things are well under 25 now. So, you know, monitoring uh, the uh, the Deutsche Banks, the Credit Suisse, the Commerce Banks, the uh, HSBC, uh, for some type of a value down here, doesn't seem to be a bad thing to keep an eye on because the, they are very big companies, right? And they are discounted. And historically, when uh, you're dealing with companies that are not going to go away and they go on big, big discounts, and now you're hearing all the um, job uh, cuts, you know, the idea might be that we're in the more mature stage of this news rather than people thinking that there's massive uh, drop going to happen. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to snap back up like a, a crazy thing. Uh, like uh, one of the guys was saying, I think Lance said, you know, don't look for these things to go way, way back up. But, you know, if, it, if we're within 10% um, uh, of their lower area or 20% of their lower area, it's not a bad time to investigate because they are paying pretty good dividends. Of course, they could be cut. And the yields on their preferreds are very high. And, of course, that could be problematic too. But this is a time not to run away from them just because the news is bad because those who ran away from oil stocks um, missed out on moves, uh, you know, from 35 to 50 on Royal Dutch, Chevron to 75 to 102, plus they're getting well paid on the dividend. So, you know, I would say um, that's what I'd be keeping an eye on a little bit this week. Okay. Um, uh, let me go to Jason, then I'll give my final comments on this stuff. Uh, Jason, do you have anything more you want to add uh, on what you're looking at this upcoming week? Yeah, actually, I would, real quick. Um, sure. The um, We were talking about um, the issue of the election being front and center in everybody's mind and the next debate being a big deal. And I think uh, the uh, the probability, I think, is really high right now that uh, the the swing voter, the person who's not normally, who, who, a person who can be easily influenced to go one way or the other, in other words, not the hardcore Democrat or a hardcore Republican, the swing voter, right? that person is going to make the absolute determining factor in the election. And I, I don't think right now anyone is going to be able to figure out who that person's voting for in a large enough number to be able to anticipate the actual outcome of the election. And I, I think that's because, you know, one of the other guests hit on that. They said, you know, the, the Trump would be a very uh, difficult person to elect right now because a lot of people in his own party don't support him, right? Yep. And Hillary, we all know, has a very hardcore Democratic backing, but she's neck and neck with the guy. So where is his support coming from? His support's coming from somebody else is coming from the swing voter, the person who, who sometimes votes Democratic, sometimes votes Republican. And those people, they, they go back and forth all the time. And I think right now, because we don't really know what that's going to be, the market is going to be really heavily focused on every single nuance that comes out of any of these reports prior to the election. In other words, before the election happens, they're going to debate whether or not a thousand jobs or not in the non-farm or one of the um, uh, uh, revisions is enough to sway Fed to make a move in December or if they're going to wait till March. It's going to be front and center in everybody's mind so much that you're going to see huge amounts of volatility develop between now and the election. And that's what I'm saying is if you if you're willing to wait, you know, by using a little more patient point of view, the average typical market participant is working in a time frame of 72 hours or less. So he's the guy that's going to drive stocks higher or the S&P higher on Friday. He's not even in the game yet. He hasn't made his move yet. He's waiting for news to come out. Maybe he's waiting for ADP to make his, his decision. And he, he could be swayed tomorrow based on what the election uh, is, is in front and center in his mind. When new piece of news comes out that could sway the voter there. So I really think I really think the volatility is going to increase between now and the end of the actual election date in November, and you can use that to your advantage if you're willing to buy dips because I don't think the volatility is going to increase to the downside. There's got there there's nobody going to say it's not between now and the election day. You're never going to see something that says Trump 55, Hillary 42. You're never going to see that. What you're going to see is it's going to be 
Hillary 41, Trump 39, Hillary 42, Trump 40, uh, Trump 41, Hillary 41 and a half. And, and we're all waiting for that swing voter. So the most likely, most likely uh, uh, event, in my opinion now, without going making a long story any longer, is the volatility is going to increase to the upside between now and the actual voting day in November. And I think buying dips is probably going to be your best strategy right now. You, you know, you've got another day or two to, for the S&P to set up. And, you know, you test, test a little bit lower and you look at those technical numbers that everybody likes. You could be a buyer down there and just wait till Friday, cover before the close. Because I think you're going to see most of the time it's all going to be status quo, business as usual, buy dips. And like I said before, I don't think the, the people who are trying to sell into this market, the top pickers, they're not professional money. They're too small. They don't have enough firepower to push the market lower. And so their stops are above the market waiting to get tagged. And that's going to be the fuel that will drive the S&P higher, I think. So I think part of that's going to be the fact that the volatility will increase because there's no way to call the election until actually uh, Wednesday the next morning. Yeah, I think you can call the election now. I think Trump lost the entire swing vote on the last debate. It's unlikely he's going to get it back. And, you know, the Democrats have a whole bunch of surprise revelations lined up for this month. I mean, yesterday we got his 95 tax return. Sometime this month we find out that Donald Trump has herpes. <laughs> you know, you think this election's got nasty until now, just wait. So, um, uh, however, uh, I do see volatility rising also, but you want to be buying the dips. I do. I really think you need to be buying dips, yeah. Yeah, but I, you could, this is a classic setup for a rising volatility on no movement in stock situation because the very fact that the unknown, it's not unknown to me, but it's unknown for most people what this election's going to have. You could have riots, you could have shootings. Trump's offered to have guards at all the polls to make sure there's no election fraud. I mean, uh, anything could happen. So, um, but ultimately we go up. Ultimately we go up. So just a question of, you know, how much volatility you want to take until then. Yeah, it, um, from my perspective, volatility is uh, the thing I'm waiting for. Like we, we, as you guys mentioned, we have been in a range for a while, and I mean, really, we since the beginning of July till early September, the market just drifted. Right, it was almost no movement. Then we had basically two days of movement, and since then, we've been in a, kind of a triangle where it's been narrowing and narrowing again. So that dip on September 9th, 10th, kind of set the low for us. And right prior to that, we got the high level. Um, those are kind of the breakout levels, up or down. Um, and not that we couldn't kind of have a false breakout in either direction, but uh, like you guys, I, I think we're more likely to go up. Um, but I, you know, I'm not seeing any strong edges for short-term trading right here. Um, and I probably won't see many strong edges for short-term trading until we get um, some more violent moves. So from my standpoint, my trading, um, you know, I'm basically flat. I'm trying to be, or not trying to be, I am patient. And uh, I'm just waiting for the next uh, uh, strong move to create some kind of strong edge that I'll look to take advantage of. And a lot of times that's, uh, that's, an overreaction when, when in one direction or the other is where I see strong edges. So if we get a if we get that volatile move down, then yeah, I will almost certainly be a buyer of it. If we get a a sharp move up, uh, I may or may not be looking to short it, or I may be waiting for it to consolidate or pull back before I jump on board. But um, uh, I'm I'm with you. And as far as news this week, um, you know, there's a lot of Potential catalysts out there. I don't know what would really uh, spark such a move, but I'm just I I'll probably be waiting for a move before I make my next one. Is kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I would go totally with that. Um, you know, I think our last chance for a really serious breakdown was last week uh, when oil really looked like it was going back to the 30s, and then this OPEC deal came out, which artificially supports oil for two more months. So, um, you know, 
if oil had hit the 30s, you would have had a complete meltdown in the energy sector. That could have taken the spies down to about 207 or so. That's gone now. So we're really looking at our lows. Probably the 13 low is the lows for the month. So um, we're going to just have to live with that. And, you know, rather than try and out trade a non moving market, better just to do your research and pick your names on, um, uh, you know, what to buy on the next move. You can trade, volatility is moving enough now where you have a tradable range of about 25%. We did two round trips last week between 12 and 15. Those were good money makers. Um, that was not the case in July and August, uh, where the range was so narrow you couldn't even trade the fix. But you know, <laughs> fix is tradable now, but it may be the only thing that's tradable here. Uh, yeah, the, the fix is always tradable. It seems uh, even when it's uh, even when it's not moving, you'll end up with big contango or back. Or well, when it's not moving, you end up with some. Kind of contango that you can you can use to trade. Yeah, uh, I call it trading yes. devoid of the thought process. Buy at eleven, sell at fifteen. Any more complicated than that, you're going to lose money. <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, let's go to the the question of the week here, which is uh, who was the most influential trader in, in in your career? Actually, let me read it. Let me read it verbatim. So that I don't mess the question up. Which is, who's the most influential and or inspirational to your trading career and why? Um, how about we start with, uh, I'll go, uh, I can't remember what direction I went last time, but I'll go bottom up here, uh, Jim Kenny. Um, I don't really have uh, one guy that I would uh, would uh, look to, but obviously Paul Tudor Jones has some fundamentally good ideas and certainly not a terrible guy to uh, take a look at. Um, but getting back to, because I didn't get to comment on the last question, and I feel a little oh, left I'm out. So I'm, go I'm going to grab the microphone. I hope it's go working. Go for it. I, I hope it's did. working. I'm sorry. Can you hear me breathing in the microphone? I can. <laughs> I'm, I'm, full, yeah. I'm fully sober. I want you to know that. Okay. So anyway, uh, here's what I'm seeing here, and uh, a couple of you guys did uh, touch on it. The uh, VIX, when it gets to 13 or less, it's been a situation where it's been fairly low. And if you're an option player, when options are extremely cheap, you can strangle positions, which means you buy calls and puts at the same price, go to the beach, hopefully you come back, and it has made a move. And uh, that has been something that's been fairly interesting to look at. And uh, I think John mentioned, uh, you know, 15 to 18. You know, we've been as low as 11 to 20. So obviously, if you're patient and you go under 12, and then it goes to 20, which was a 46 point jump, 46% uh, move jump in the VIX, there was a big hit to be had there if you're using things like end of month or something like that. So there is an opportunity with the VIX because if you consistently do that, and this VIX really freaks out uh, because you know, I don't know how you guys feel, but this volume and this range, I mean, uh, as I said in my broadcast with you guys uh, in the beginning of the month, I said after we came back from Labor Day, hey, guys, the lowest volatility in, um, in the stock market since 1965 just occurred in the month of August. And this month of September we just got through, that volatility stunk too. So obviously there's going to be a burgeoning uh, – people like you guys were talking about when I when it breaks out I'm gonna play the deal well that volume who's gonna take the other side of it and the and the answer to that is I don't know but if it's market makers and guys like that your offer is gonna be way high and if it's market makers and it comes in on the sell side as John was saying 25 percent will look like a good day possibly if the volume really came in on the downside so the bottom line here is is that uh, you know I think uh, this uh, next uh, uh, what do you call it, a debate, is going to be real important because this guy cannot keep talking about these irrelevant topics. And if Trump would say to the questioner, the questioner, when he says, what about this uh, beauty contest? Or if he says something about, uh, you know, this uh, tax returns, you know, if he had comments like, really, are we here to talk about my 1995 tax return where I legally uh, forwarded my losses like every other person in my position would do? Or are we here to really talk about a contest from 20 years ago? If he comes with that attitude and reduce the questioner to an, a, a stupid person who is taking a 100 million, 100 million person audience and wasting their time 
because people want to hear about repatriating jobs and profits. They want to hear about resolving immigration, and they want to hear about different tactics on terror and our and how we go into other countries and get in there. They want to hear about realistic health care costs and college education. You know, and if he can switch it from that to that, and that's a big if because we know this guy's all over the place. But if he did that, and he and he reduced these people. I mean, if I was the guy, if they asked me those kind of questions with 100 million people watching and I was going for the presidency, I would make the guy who asked that question look like a moron because they're moron questions. I mean, our ser the seriousness of the job he's going for is ridiculous to even at a, at a 100 million person uh, debate. But he takes the bait and that's why he's going down and that's why the probability 70 percent Hillary wins. So you don't hear about the 1986 Miss Universe competition in the next debate. Yeah, I mean, you know what I'm saying, but I mean, you're an intelligent guy. Do you find that uh, either uh, it should be fodder for uh, TV, which is what this whole thing has ended up to be? Well, I'll tell you, the uh, the tax issue, of those swing voters, the majority are working people who take the full tax hit on every question, are probably paying a 36% tax rate. Yeah, and CNN, and CNN knows that, and NBC knows that. They know who, they're not talking to CPAs out of, uh, out of Harvard. They're not talking to Cooper's right. Librand or anybody like that. They know who they're listening to. They're obviously taking something that's way above their head, and they're simplifying it using buzzwords like "didn't pay tax." And it we, was. you know, you, hey John, you know, if you took a real estate loss in '92 of a billion dollars because uh, Atlantic City went right down the sewer, you would not walk away from that loss and not try to rebuild your life and your business using the law. And that's the thing that's really silly is, you know, these people who run our country are all lawyers, right? right. Uh, all 50%. Lawyers. And, and they are crucifying this guy from following the code that they put in, which means he's following the law. Yet he's being portrayed by the other side as if he's some kind of an evil guy. But I'm not on one side or the other here. I'm just saying that could affect the market. And if the guy comes out with a different brand, like he, like you know a more what i was mentioning then all this celebration that hillary's doing and all the people holding stocks figuring that the 70 percent chance is going to work because obviously 70 percent probability is a very high probability you'd certainly hold your stocks if it was 70 percent chance going up right yeah my so, bet is leopard doesn't change his spots yeah no well that's true that's what i'm trying to say the bet is hold on right that's yeah. the bet right but but uh, like I say, so um, I would think that when the volatility gets very low and people who are specula speculatively trading, obviously, uh, the strangle would be something uh, to at least price out and see if it made any sense. Yeah. And that was the only thing I wanted to say. No, the no-brainer is the next fixed move to uh, 12, the 12 handle, which is you know, only a point away. Right. Right. And, you know, if the VIX goes down to 10, 11, 12, and that means uh, and the volatility is very low, you know, you're going to see probably some volatility pickup as we go through, obviously, the end of the calendar year and the beginning of the new year where people do move their money around a lot. Oh, you have to. Yeah. All right. Um, we uh, I'm enjoying all this discussion, but I'm also looking at the clock here and we, we do need to uh, to kind of get through these last uh, last few questions. So, uh, if uh, for the for the audience out there, Jim, you mentioned um, uh, Paul Tudor was very influential for you. Um, John, how about you? Who who's uh, been an influential or inspirational in your trading career? Well, George Soros uh, was a client of mine for about ten years. Taught me you can do all the research in the world, but at the end of the day. Uh, it's money flows that determine whether things go up or down. So you got to be watching the flow of funds at all time. And uh, uh, another client, War uh, Warren Buffett, really got me focused on company operating cash flows. He absolutely loves cash flows, and over a long term, that is a huge winner. And both these guys have tons of books out, by the way. You should read all of them. It's, it's a free education. Yeah, and those uh, I I gotta say those are two pretty good guys to get influenced by. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Jason, how about you? I'm sorry. I thought my uh, mic was still on. I'm sorry about that. I had to oh, quickly. Okay. I started talking. and I realized my mic was off. Sorry about that. Um, 
actually, I've been very fortunate to have um, one really good personal mentor coach when I was in the formative years of my uh, trading development, that's Mark Douglas. I actually uh, coached with him every week for years in the nineties. Wow. He, li he lived right around the corner from me in Chicago. It was, it was, it couldn't, it was so serendipitous, you know, uh, <clears throat> but you know, he still cost a lot of dough, <laughs> you know, but uh, it was money very well spent. And I know that he passed away recently and I, I uh, uh, consider his input, to be, you know, one of the most important in my career. And also, I, and I'm not a real big fan of some of the uh, current living traders uh, because I think they are, they're really more reactive than proactive in a lot of ways with how they um, disseminate information about their success and what's been really important to them That's and all the rest. True. Say that again. That's very true. Yeah. So, but I think the more proactive guy that, even though he's been dead for decades, is uh, Jesse Livermore. I've read everything I can find yeah. on Livermore. And if anybody out there has got something new on Livermore, you're welcome to send it my way. I'd love to see it. And uh, also, if you happen to have a signature of his, I'd be interested in buying it. Uh, but I really consider him, I really consider him to be one of the, uh, the he, he's he's got to be the only guy in the world ever that, made this whole business um, down to earth and common sense base and was able to communicate that, uh, you know, through his writings and his effort and uh, people who've studied him, you know, after, now that he's gone, of course, but people that have studied him, they all come to the same conclusion that you know, whatever he was thinking about, it was on a whole other level. And uh, boy, I would love to be able to have a mind like that, you know, so, but I consider Livermore to be the most important. And I was very fortunate to work directly with Mark Douglas. And I would suggest anyone that is out there, has got a limited budget, one or two books by Mark Douglas in that library would really go a long way to solving your problem. Yeah. And Jesse Livermore, I think uh, reminiscences of a stock, stock, trader, operator. Yeah. stock operator was uh, maybe the first or second book mm -hmm. I ever read on stock trading and still probably one of the the it was the uh, yeah. It was the uh, it was the sec. It was the second one I ever read. The first one I read was when I was a customer. I said, "Well, how do I figure out how to do this?" And the broker I was talking to said, "You need to read a book called How to Chart Your Way to Stock Market Profits." And I bought that line of BS one thousand <laughs> percent. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not a real big fan of people who use technical analysis as the only way to figure Probably. out where the market might go. By the way, my newsletter post today is called Why Technical Analysis Doesn't Work. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, I've written so much on that subject myself. I mean, I've lost friends, family, and, and, and customers, from my point of view, on analysis. And I really think that uh, it's, it's tragic that people put so much emphasis on. Do you know, do you ever stop to think about this, guys? All this happened because the input of computers into our lives. You know, the, the whole issue of technical analysis and algorithms on top of algorithms and all that's supposed to help us fine tune an edge and in the entire sense since all of recorded history the biggest fortunes that have ever been made in futures options equities trading all happened before the invention of the computer livermore didn't even own a telephone you know i mean the, the technical analysis is being fed out like it's some kind of panacea for everything and if it was really that, if, the, if a computer could help you win in this business, then we would have the same, nobody would be, we wouldn't have 80, 90% losing traders. It would, computers would have helped us in this field the same as it's helped every other field. You know, you can buy a washing machine that can outthink you now. Uh, and, and your cost of maintaining your clothes is dropping dramatically. You don't get that in futures options or Forex. What you get in futures options and Forex is a guy who spends a hundred thousand dollars on computer software and he loses two hundred grand with it. So I don't really value the whole issue of computers and technology like other people do. And I can really, I really think, single biggest stumbling block a new trader has is he buys into that crap and then he just can't figure out why he's not making money. Well, I always ask the question: uh, How many hedge funds have a purely dedicated technical analysis strategy? And the answer is none. None, right? <laughs> Zero. It doesn't make money. 
Right. And by the way, technical analysis way predates uh, computers. I'll play my age card here. I remember in the 60s, guys used to have these huge chart books, you know, paper, and they were physically updated every day. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had, yeah, I had those when I was in, I uh, first started trading too. I'm very familiar with that. What I, what I meant by, com, uh, by use of computers and technical analysis is that they've taken technical analysis and they believe the that adding, yeah. yeah, adding the, huge amount of computing power uh, is going to be a benefit. And, it, and that there's all these algorithms that never would have existed before if it wasn't for that ability. And it's not helpful. You know, not yeah, at all. It happen faster, that's all. You lose money faster. You lose a lot faster. <laughs> with computers, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with both of you on that one. I, I've found... Um, I, I found a lot of what I do in my career that I've learned from um, running my own tests, doing my own studies, and uh, without computers, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. I've I've unlearned a lot that I was originally taught about the market, um, and some of it was technical analysis uh, type stuff that when I ran the studies, I found did not hold up. Uh, so I've saved myself a, an awful lot. Uh, and been able to identify some, some good edges that I've traded over the years um, thanks to computers. So I'm not sure where I'd be without it, but, um, you know, teach his own. Um, I, I do respect the, uh, your point of views, though. I, I see where you're coming. It's, it's not, you can't just plug in and, and hope you're going to make a bunch of money. you got to be able to, to – you've you got to be able to manage the trades as well. Can I just mention one thing on that? As I think that what you touched on when you just said that yep. is is that you've understood the relationship between your personal psychology, how you think, and what kind of tool can help you achieve the right goal. See, the Pablo Picasso said computers are useless because they don't ask any questions. You're asking questions that have to do with how the underlying structure and psychology of the market is set up. And if you can get a computer to help you answer that, then it's a viable tool. And, I, and our analysis, technical analysis or fundamental analysis can help you answer that. That's a viable tool. What I'm saying is, is that that's all it can do, is if you don't know how to ask the right questions, you're screwed using it. You know, that's, yep. So, I, yep. I, so I would say you're probably, you're just as half right as the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, we're getting near the end here. So um, Lance, why don't I go to you? Uh, the... the Trader or traders that were most influential in your career and why, and then I'll also uh, let you go ahead and uh, and give us any final comments you have. If there's anything going on with uh, Alpha Shark that we need to be need to be aware of, um, or if you had a, if you want to weigh in on anything else here today, uh, I just want to do a if you have a stock pick or anything. Um, the uh, if you have a quick uh, trade idea you'd like to share too. Oh, yep. Okay. okay. Perfect. Um, so who really kind of uh, showed me some good trading techniques was uh, uh, he was a fund manager, a writer for professional traders opinion. Um, and uh, we would trade futures together. Uh, Ron George, um, he was pretty, you know, I never saw someone trade size uh, until uh, until I was trading with him, you know, I'm used to you know, your five lots, maybe a 10 lot, but trading really, you know, a thousand contracts of the S and P a day, uh, you know, 800 contracts of NASDAQ, something major like that years ago, you know, kind of opened up my eyes to trading, how much money you can make, but not only how much money you could lose as well. Uh, more importantly, um, as far as, uh, wrap ups, for Alpha Shark, we do have our open house this week to where for free you have a you could go into the live trading room from 9 a.m. to 4:30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you can watch us trade live, so that is a free open house. Just visit alphashark.com, or you can find uh, Twitter Lance Polito, and you can find the link there. And for trading idea for the week. Um, if, if you're a, a long side investor, you like to, you're not really a fan of the short side. Um, you know, seeing a lot of money flow into the airliners today, Delta specifically, 
uh, some of the short-term calls uh, in Delta today, seeing a lot of option flow. Um, so I'm looking at some of the airliners that could be a ploy to kind of, uh, you know, if you're looking or if you have a bias that the market will go up, the airliners are looking pretty strong today uh, for an idea. And as always, you go reach me, Lance at AlphaShark.com, Lance at Polito at Twitter. Uh, and as always, great being here. Excellent. Thank you, Lance. Uh, I'll go down my list. So we'll go Jason, then John, then then Jim, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll finish up quick. Uh, so, uh, Jason, if, uh, if you got a quick trade idea for us and, uh, and some final comments uh, about yeah. uh, line out line or, or your stuff. Yeah, I'll just be real brief. Um, you know, I think the uh, gorilla on the coffee table trade for this next 60 to 90 days is the British pound. Um, you've had some record short positions in futures going on and off, according to the commitment of traders report, and the market's hovering near 30 year lows. This whole Brexit thing is baked in the cake, and I think what people really fail to appreciate about it is that what the British have just done is they've just decoupled from all of the next huge, massive, sideways to lower problems that the Eurozone is going to have, and they just said, we're out, and they're going to be in a position to move a lot faster, a lot more aggressively, and it's going to help their economy. They just took control back of their sovereignty. So now they're in a position, I think, to do more economically quicker than the Eurozone is. And I think that's going to help their currency. It's going to help investment. And I think that, uh, you know, you're sitting at a 30-year loan to British pounds. We get a little bit of a lift up here by the end of the year. And the next year to two years, it could put on 20%. You know, so it could be a, it could be a really screaming buy right here at the 29 handle. So that, that's my freebie um, for the week, uh, for the next 60 days, I think. And as far as uh, the lion is concerned, you're welcome to just shoot me an email, liononline.com. There's an email thing in there if you like, and I'll put you in the database and and uh, I'll be happy to uh, offer you my pearls of wisdom any chance I can. And uh, thanks for having me again on the Timing Research Show. I love doing this show, and I, I'm, I'm glad we got great people doing it. And every time I come, I learn something new because the uh, guys that you have on are so qualified. So I appreciate you being um, available to me and, and being a part of the uh, broadcast. So thanks again. All right. Th uh, thanks, Jason. Thanks for all your insights today as well. Um, John, can we move down to uh, to you uh, quickly for uh, some final comments and a trade idea if you have one uh, for the week? Uh, well, I have to go with my big trade idea, which is to go short the British pound. Uh, I should mention that I'm an uh, independent advisor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, but I was in England for the. Best. I've been advising the Tory Party how to tor torpedo it. Uh, not only did they decouple themselves from Europe's problems, they decoupled themselves from all their customers too. And the British economy is going to be terrible. But that is something an easy one for this. Well, there, there, but Jim, that that that's uh, the whole thing, John. That's what makes the markets right there. Yeah, Which right. argument is more viable? You know, in the long uh, so. you know, I'd still be selling rallies in pound. The easy one this week, trade the 12-15 range in the VIX. That's the easiest thing out there for the individual investor trading at home. And if we get any kind of rally in bonds, put on a short position. You know, mm -hmm. the Fed has basically promised us a rate rise uh, in December. They're probably not going to do it. But they're still promising it, and as long as that promise is out there, which is two more months at least, uh, bonds will not rise above 141. So we have puts, put spreads, and negative short positions on U.S. Treasury bonds. All right, great. Thank you, John. Thanks for all your insights today, too. Uh, very interesting uh, with the election views and everything. And you can find us at madhedgefundtrader.com. And if you want to send me a death threat, uh, you're more than welcome to. I'll just throw <laughs> in with all the others I get every day. All right. Uh, Jim, uh, anything you want to tell us about uh, Options Professor, final comments, and if you have a trade idea, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, the people that are interested in learning more about the uses and risks of all the different strategies and options, the DVDs at optionprofessor.com can give them good disclosure and good ideas on that. As far as um, a specific uh, idea, I don't have, but I would say on, a, uh, on just a, a little more of a macro view, um, when this VIX uh, gets down uh, low, like it did when I was on the broadcast after Labor Day, 
it does open up uh, the, the window that volatility can increase. And right after the Labor Day uh, meeting we had, volatility jumped up 46% on the VIX. So if we're going to have two debates and we're going to have an election and we're coming into the end of the year and then we're going into the new year, I think if the VIX goes on holiday and comes back down, uh, it would be an opportunity to look into volatility trades, which are strangles and straddles, and then price them out and see if you want to take the risk of that. And Because uh, there could be um, a day, a week, or a period of time uh, in the next uh, 30, 60, 90 days where the volatility could pick up substantially if things don't go where most people think it's going to go. And so uh, when everyone is kind of thinking uh, things are going to work out a certain way, uh, sometimes it creates an opportunity for the other guy on the other side of the trade. So keep an eye on that and, uh, you know, some points on the S&P, 2130 area, 2100 area on the downside, and, of course, 2200 on the upside. And uh, when they decide which way they want to break it, uh, hopefully they'll do so in an orderly fashion. But that never happens, so keep hoping, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> have, a, have a good day, and thank you very much for having me again. Thanks, Jim. Uh, let me just uh, wrap up uh, from my standpoint as well. Uh, I, I never answered the question of who um, who was influential in my career, so I'll do that quickly. Um, Brett Steenbarger uh, is someone that I've followed a lot. He's the first guy that I ever saw put uh, kind of psychology and quant together. Um, a lot of his ideas are, are um, go along with you know Mark Douglas's teachings as well, who uh, who Jason mentioned. Um, but he he does have a uh, uh, a lot of a, a, a quant type tilt to them, which I always found interesting. Uh, another guy is uh, Scott Andrews, who I've now partnered with um, over at Invest Quant. Um, we became friends several years back, and I think we influenced each other in our in our trading, and uh, ended up being a good partnership for us. So those are uh, those are two guys that have influenced me quite a bit. Um, I. I'm not going to offer a trade idea out there this week simply because, as I said, I'm sitting on my hands. We're stuck in a range. I'm not seeing strong short-term edges if um, in, in the things that I trade, and that's primarily um, equity indices and, and, and ETFs and some large-cap stocks. Uh, but I, I don't even trade the large-cap stocks unless I'm seeing edges in the in the indices. And right now, it's, it's chop, and um, I, I want to see um, – something more substantial before I start jumping into things. Um, lastly, if uh, uh, you can reach me at uh, quantifiableedges.com or investaquant.com, uh, you can always take a free trial at Quantifiable Edges. Uh, Investaquant, uh, we have, uh, uh, um, in addition to the intraday edges, we have swing edges there, and I do do a, a newsletter, and uh, I'll be having a talk on both of those things uh, next week, I think on Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, but if people want to check that out, that'll be, that's uh, an upcoming thing that's coming at InvestQuant. And uh, uh, I'd be happy to, uh, uh, to go through a, a demo and, and kind of my ideas on swing trading there in uh, next Tuesday or Wednesday. So that's it for me. Uh, David, thank you uh, again for having me. Um, sorry, I blabbed a whole lot. And uh, went over time a little bit here. Um, right. Look forward to, to, to getting into it again next month when we'll have some yeah. really exciting stuff, right, with the election. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, great show. I uh, just want to remind everyone watching that uh, you can go to timingresearch.com and download any of the past reports or watch any of the uh, past episodes of the show there. Um, be sure to join us next week. Sam Borgi. James Ramelli, Jason Pierce, Cameron Yost, and uh, Dean Jenkins will be uh, hosting next week. Uh, also, be sure to subscribe to the uh, Timing Research YouTube channel to get get the notifications and updates on, on future episodes of the show. And, uh, and finally, I just want to thank all my guests again for this week. Lance Cipolito of AlphaShark.com, Jason Jankowski of TheLionOnline.com, John Thomas of uh, madhedgefundtrader.com, Jim Kenny of optionprofessor.com, and uh, Rob Hanna of investaquant.com. Thanks, guys.